It's July and one of the world's greatest sporting spectacles is about to happen. Hello again everybody, I'm Phil Liggett along with Paul Sherwin. The Tour de France this year starting from the city of Rouen and this is the River Seine, the same river which passes through Paris where the three week race will end its near 4,000 kilometres. Well, Rouen is famous for many things but to cyclists in particular it is famous for one man. Now here's Gary Imlach to tell us more. You know, according to my copy of The Rough Guide, Rouen spends more of its money on public monuments than any other town in France. And it's easy to believe because this place is populated by a plaster cast of thousands, from Flaubert, who lived in Rouen, to Joan of Arc, who died here. Until now, though, local boy Jacques Anquetil, the first man ever to win five tours, has had nothing. Not even a single by orchestral manoeuvres in the dark named after him. This week, though, both the town and the tour have been making amends. Joint billing with Napoleon in front of the town hall wasn't bad for a start, and there's been plenty more. On Wednesday, Rouen marked the 10th anniversary of Jacques Anquetil's death and the 40th of his first tour win in 1957 by renaming one of its major boulevards after him. Yesterday, in the tiny village of Concampois, where Anquetil's buried, the tour did its bit with a wreath-laying ceremony at his grave. On hand to pay their respects, along with his old teammates, were the only three men ever to match Anquetil's total of tour wins, Eddie Merckx, Bernard Eno, and Miguel Indurain. To understand what all the fuss is about, you have to go back to the early 60s, when Onkatil was destroying world-class fields without seeming to suffer so much as a bad hair day. His chosen weapon was the time trial, and his chief victim was usually his great rival, Raymond Poulidor. Autant nous étions adversaires et quelquefois nous nous sommes haïs lorsque nous étions en compétition, autant notre amitié est devenue forte lorsque nous avons mis un cours à notre carrière. In cycling, though, even champions are supposed to suffer. And while the Downsworth Poulidor was eternally popular for being eternally second, Anquetil won four tours in a row between 1961 and 64, to the polite applause the public reserves for those they've decided are too good looking and talented to be really lovable. It wasn't until he died of cancer in 1987 at the age of 53 that many people in French cycling realised what a champion they'd lost. And perhaps not until this week that they got around to formally acknowledging it. What a great rider he was, Jacques Anquetil. Now to the 84th Tour de France, starting with the 7.3 kilometres prologue. Chris Borman is expected to do the winning time. He knows exactly what he's got to do now because an early starter off number 44, Jan Ulrich, has finished with a time of 8 minutes and 22 seconds. So the gauntlet is down. Fifth on the back to start, Chris Borman. Well, Borman is a specialist at this kind of solitary effort. He's already won the prologue of the Tour de France in 1994. But, Phil, I think a very clever move by Telecom. Bjarne Ries had to start last man, but they put another man at the early part just in case of weather changes. Well, the indications are that Borman, one second better at halfway on Ulrich, so it's not a great time by Chris Borman, but it's going to be possibly the best. He'll have to sprint to convince everybody, though, because Ulrich's time has withstood just about everybody. As Borman puts his head down, he's done it. 8.20, 1.82 seconds quicker. Chris Borman is top of the leaderboard, and nobody will beat that. So Borman gets the prologue time trial for the second time in his career. He beats Ulrich, Evgeny Berzin, by five, Tony Romming, a good ride fourth. Alex Zur, the complete with a broken collarbone, is fifth. And Bjorn Arise there, Paul, 13th for him. He won't be too unhappy with that, but Boardman gets the first Mayo Jaune of the Tour de France. And Chris will wear that today on the opening stage in Rouen to Forge Les Eaux, 192 kilometres, not very far away, in fact, the finish, though, from the start city. And immediately the race has got underway on the narrow roads of Normandy, massive pile-up. And it looks to me, Paul, as though something like 60 riders involved in this one. Well, certainly has caused a traffic jam, but one or two riders staying down on the ground there, I think one or two may well be seriously injured. But you can see the chaos, riders trying to get into the gutter at the side to get round and carry on with the racing. Well, this is the latest of a series of crashes today. We'll try and pick up that rider who is lying down in the road at the moment. A lot of riders here showing no concern about remounting and getting on with the Tour de France because there's a lot of riders got away up front, but it's also around the epicentre down there. One rider is on the floor, and uh, we'll try and get down in there and see who it is. Alex Zulla is one rider who's been delayed as well, and he's not going to be too pleased with that, Paul, especially with his damaged collarbone. Well, that operation just before the Tour de France, he was hoping would be able to ride down to the mountains without too many problems. You can see Alex Zola there, but the rider on the floor is one of the riders from Big Matt Aubert. 
Well, I think it's Gilles Talmont who's gone down and we've left him behind on the road now as the riders have regrouped after a long chase over the countryside. A number of riders have been delayed by that crash, and so it won't be a massive bunch sprint here today. But they're slowly getting themselves back together as we run down towards the finish now at Forge Les Oaks. And I think everybody's going to look out for Mario Cipollini to see if he can take on Eric Zorbel, the green jersey last year in the Tour de France. And he's sprinting so well this year. And it looks as though Zorbel is going to try and interfere with the result of the first stage. A lot of fanning out by the main field here, but a very small group indeed, about 50 riders competing for the sprint. Chris Borman has made the split, but the time bonuses could well lose him the race lead. As the finish approaches, Mario Cipollini leads all the way to the line. Now the time bonus he has got by crossing the line should be just enough to give him the Mayo Jean. And this group coming in now contains Bjorn Aris losing 58 seconds on day one of the Tour de France, while Mario Cipollini, complete with his American shorts, there he get fine for those, is enjoying the victory. And look at the speed of this man. Five stage wins in the Tour of Italy. He's opened his account again on the first stage now of the Tour de France. He makes it look so easy, finishing ahead of Tom Steele's here. The Belgian champion riding his first Tour de France. And in the white jersey there is Frédéric Moncassin. But there you can see Steele's just snicking second place. Here he comes over the hill, the big man stamping his authority again on the sprint stage of the Tour de France. So a super win for Super Mario. He's now the leader of the Tour de France. But those shorts, well, they're illegal. He will be fine. And Paul Schoen put the question to him. Demain, vous allez mettre un, un cuissard jaune et un vélo jaune Oui, oui, demain, nous avons déjà préparé un vélo et un cuissard jaune. Mario, cette année, le maillot rose dans le Tour d'Italie, le maillot jaune dans le Tour de France, laquelle est la plus belle Ce sont tous les deux plus belles. On veut vivre en deux modes différents. Le Tour d'Italie, c'est le cœur, et ici, c'est la chose plus grande du monde. Well, Mario should know, and we look forward now to him riding the yellow bike in the Tour de France. So the ever-present dangers of taking part in the Tour de France yesterday highlighted on the very first stage. More than two-thirds of the field affected by that massive pile-up. For some of the big favourites, well, they really did lose out. But for others, of course, they profited. Here's Gary Imlac to report. The chief beneficiary at the expense of his team leader, Bjarne Rees, was Telecom's Jan Ulrich. Ulrich served notice of his potential when he comprehensively beat Rees in last year's final time trial on his way to second place overall. This year, it seemed the only thing holding him back would be team orders to work for the boss. But after beating Reese again in the prologue, Ulrich now finds himself over a minute up on his leader who was caught behind the crash. Team orders may have to be rethought. With Ulrich on the right side of the spill was Spain's leading Miguel Inderain impersonator, Abraham Alano. He's enhanced the likeness this year by taking Big Mick's spot at Benesto, but he knows that only a win will make it truly convincing. The only real French contender is Richard Veron. After three wins, the novelty's worn off the King of the Mountains competition for him, and he'll be looking to apply his climbing ability to the general classification. Veron finished ahead of the crash yesterday, unlike Yevgeny Berzin, who lost 58 seconds as a result. That and his ability to self-destruct, as he did to lose the yellow jersey last year, make him an outside bet. Alex Zuller isn't so much a bet for the Tour as an insurance risk. He arrived with half a dozen screws in a broken collarbone after a crash three weeks ago and went down again yesterday, falling 1.35 behind Ulrich and the rest of the challengers to Bjarne Rees. Which brings us to the defending champion himself. Last year, Rees finally completed the transformation from jobbing rider to tour winner, but at the age of 33, he's not keen on making the return journey. He didn't fare as badly as Zulli yesterday and still lost 58 seconds to the leading group now 1 minute 11 seconds down on Ulrich. That's by no means a disaster for Reese this early in the race, but it could be the start of an interesting dilemma for his team. And this is where the leading contenders stand at the moment. Jan Ulrich currently third, 12 seconds off the pace, and Alano up there in fifth, he's 20 seconds down. So on to stage two now, the race are passing away from Normandy into Brittany, 262 kilometres, it's a long, long way today, Paul. Well, Mario Cipollini resplendent in his yellow jersey, yellow shorts and the yellow bicycle. And he's got one little dream in the back of his mind, Phil. He'd like to win in that attire. 
<laughs> you forgot the yellow gloves, glasses and socks. Anyway, the TVM team are trying to set this up today for Jerome Blylevens, who usually pulls one stage win in a Tour de France. In the final kilometre now, it's been a day of attack and counter-attack, but the field has come back together. And now it looks as though TVM are trying to give Blylevens the victory. Mario Cipollini right on the far right as we look at the picture here, and he looks to be in a bad position as he makes her way up to a finish in Via. And they're already out of the tour today. Another rider retired, by the way, Arsenio Gonzalez of Kelme, went out in the first out with his crash injuries from yesterday. Anyway, the sprinters now are trying to wind it up towards the line here. It looks to me, Paul, as though hopelessly boxed in now is Cipollini as the field swings across towards the left of our picture. It looks as though Cipollini has got himself in an awful mess today. The man in yellow perhaps suffering a little bit from pre-race nerves. Robbie McEwen dodging about on the far left. First time Aussie in the tour. Cipollini's got through. I can't believe he came through that gap, but he saw it and he's free as a bird. Mario Cipollini is taking the stage right on the line. And the rider who's just on his wheel was Zabel. And the other man will have to be content with third place, Jerome Blylevens. Well, Cipollini won his first stage in the Magli Rosa in the Tour of Italy this year. Now he's done likewise in the yellow jersey in the Tour de France. This has opened up an intriguing prospect now on stage three as we go from Via to Plumelec because now Mario Cipollini could become the first man for 49 years to win three stages in a row. Well, the other Italian, Gino Bartoli, was the legend who did it back in 1948. And now, can Mario Cipollini do the same? The omens are there. Mario Cipollini is, of course, Italian, and like Bartoli, he's now wearing a yellow jersey. So he can dream of three stages in a row as he starts out now on the stage here of 224 kilometres from Via to Plumelec. Paul, can he do it? It's going to be very difficult because very few people have done it over recent years, but he is happily installed at the top of the leaderboard. Cipollini with 36 seconds over Chris Boardman and Ulrich 38 seconds behind. One thing's for certain, Phil's already at the finish line in Plumelec. Well, I wonder if Mario Cipollini will be standing here on the winner's podium at the end of today's stage here in Plumelec. It's not really his sort of finish, you know, because just off to my right here is a small climb. But the way Mario's been riding these past two days, you won't find too many people who'll bet against him. But before we go to the day's action, let's join Paul Sherwin, who'll tell us more about the great skills of this Italian bike rider. If you want to be a sprinter, take some lessons from Mario Cipollini. 400 metres to go, and he seems to be completely locked in the pack behind 20 other riders. But a good sprinter never gives up. He's always waiting and hoping that the gaps will appear, like a gate that he'll try to keep open with his handlebars and his shoulders. It takes courage, daring and the acceleration to go through. Inside 200 metres to go, the sprint begins. All the other riders are too scared to hit the front early and that's why Cipollini's the best. He has the power and the speed to come around the outside when everybody else in the middle falters. It's risky. Even when Zabel in the pink opens up his sprint, Cipollini has to choose whether to go left or right. He flicks his bike around the German's wheel opens the gate up to the finish and powers away on a massive gear of 53 by 11. Unheard of by sprinters 20 years ago, but Super Mario is a sprinter of today. Indeed he is, and here he is now at saint hilaire de Arquette at 37 kilometres. The small time bonus is very important for not just the green jersey, but the yellow as well. Zabel is taking on a Cipollini, and Zabel beats him. In fact, Moncasan getting second, and Cipollini only third, but he gets a two-second time bonus. The race goes on, heading towards Plumlec. Very nasty finish to the race today in Plumlec, and the riders, I think, will be very wary towards the end. Now, Super Mario looks in good form with Tony Rominger. Well, they both live in Monaco and probably train together occasionally, but I would think Mario on the flat and Tony on the hills. Well, they're having a little laugh here, but the pace is quite high, and Rominger moves slickly into line. This is the second sprint of the day, and this is at Bazoug La Perouse. 93 kilometres have been covered now. A little breakaway trying to get away, and that's uh, Jean-Luc Bortolami going over ahead of Francois Simon and Danny Nelson. This break has the lead of 2 minutes and 10 seconds over the field. Let's go back now to Gary Imlac, because after all, who is Mario Cipollini when it comes to the Tour de France? He's never finished one yet. Now then, Mario Cipollini has no chance of ever equaling Eno's record of five Tour de France wins. In fact, this is his fifth Tour, and he's yet to finish one. But then hundreds of riders have been round during that time, how many of them have you ever heard of?
In a sport populated largely by Stoics, the occasional wide boy is bound to stand out. And with his cormorant wingspan, big screen grin and General Jack the Lad outlook, Mario Cipollini ranks fairly wide. Not many riders wear loafers on the treatment table, and no one to my knowledge has ever taken the podium before in a white suit and cowboy boots, but then Chippo's riding ability is almost eclipsed by his marketability. This advert's for cycling shoes, in case you're wondering, and at home in Italy, Mario even gets TV the spots endorsing his team sponsor's coffee machines. One of them. In casa ci vuole say. Not exactly evidence of a career in acting once his day job's over, but for the moment, Chippo's happy making the most of the spotlight he's got. And whether it's as the Lion King, Super Mario, or his current incarnation as color-coordinated man about the peloton, it's all part of the marketing strategy. We have prepared everything before. I think it's a nice and beautiful for the Mario. It's a good respect for the Mario with that. And tomorrow, I think it's the same for you. I like it a lot. Of course, Mario's costume changes are strictly against the rules, which of course is the whole idea. His two days in head-to-foot yellow, along with the Stars and Stripes shorts he modelled on the first stage, mean that he's now leading the race on time, points, publicity and fines. We have already won two stages, and now we have already won a lot of points. So, we have the possibility to pay the money. Nobody questions Cipollini's supremacy in the sprint, but his ability to go the distance has always been suspect. His previous tours have been one-week French holidays. Turn up, win a couple of flat stages, then get a note from the team doctor once the going gets diagonal. For this year, Chippo's in possibly the best form of his life. He won a record five stages in the Giro, including the final one. He fancies doing the same here. Je pense que cette année j'avais une bonne possibilité parce que pourquoi mon condition c'est très bon dans ce moment. J'avais fait un bon tour d'Italie et c'est un bon travail pour, pour, pour aller faire un tour de France. Pour moi c'est parti très très bien dans ce moment, j'espère de continuer à Paris. Mario's insistence on being fully accessorized has turned the Psycho team bus into an extension of his private wardrobe. This is the Stars and Stripes bike he was riding to start the race. Here's the yellow one he's on at the moment and this is the green frame that will form the basis of his colour palette once he slips out of the race leading into the points jersey. Now I've asked the mechanics and they say they haven't been asked for anything in a polka dot yet. But then again, by the time the race hits the Pyrenees, Mario's more likely to be wearing a pained expression. Back to the race. <laughs> well, Gary, I think he's got one now as we approach the finish here. There's a nasty little climb up to Plumlek. It's Lola Broshon, the King of the Mountains, leading. Jalabert is there. Reese is here. But also not here now is Tony Rominger, and I believe he's retired from the race following the crash a few kilometres ago. Frank Vandenbroek launching the attack now. He's got Zorbel on his wheel right at the back. I'm afraid he's Cipollini. He's not in the hunt for three in a row. Zorbel has come over the top of a struggling Vandenbroek. He gets the stage, and Bjorn and Reese has got third. He'd be delighted with that. Rees getting himself back into this race. This is how it happened. Eric Zabel realising that Vandenbroek had misjudged the length of this hill, come easily over the top of him and gets the stage win, his first of this year's tour. Paul Sherwin is with him and I bet he's happy. Eric, one day after your birthday, it's almost as good as winning yesterday. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yesterday I was second and uh, for two years I win on my birthday and Okay, with uh, 70, uh, 27 years old, I feel I'm a little bit uh, better. Well, he's almost on his pension, isn't he? But this is a sad sight, Paul. This is Tony Rominger, who crashed out just before the finish of Plumlek, confirmed a broken collarbone, and at 36 years of age, I think he's ridden his last Tour de France. We're all very sad about that. The Tour, of course, goes on. And Mario Cipollini leading Zabel now by 14 seconds. Chris Borman still up there in third place and waiting for his first test in the mountains. They're still a little way away. Now we're on to stage number four. This is 223 kilometers. And it is a nice little route, this, as we start to plunge south now to Le Puy de Fou. Well, that's where the Tour de France started a couple of years ago, and the riders again on very narrow roads, and once again, lots of crashes as they go over the climb here of the Pont de Saint-Lazare, the biggest difficulty of the day. And coming off the bridge here now, the crosswinds have picked up the race, and again, a news reaching us of a little bit of a problem. We believe that Fabiano Fontanelli has hit a woman spectator and is down on the ground, but the race itself now beginning to attack for the first time here. Those crosswinds have disturbed the rhythm of the peloton and the strong men, and Ulrich again has gone to the front. He's riding so strongly at the moment. 
who's trying to set the sprint up for Eric Zabel. Really amazing to see this man all of the time when he needs to. He comes to the front working like a Trojan for his teammate. And also up there in second position is Bjarne Ries. So Telecom trying to be all dominating in the first week of the tour. Well, they're setting themselves a tough tour, you know, because they're trying to nurse the green jersey for Zabel and the yellow jersey for Rees, or is it Ulrich? Because that is still very much unclear. Anyway, Ulrich is proving the way to keep out of all these crashes this week is to get near the front and stay out of trouble. And so far, he hasn't made any mistakes here now as the team are trying to line up Zabel again for the sprint. And Nicola Minali is nosing in on this one too. So Manali's the rider in blue, Zabel is through on the rails there, he's in the green jersey. This is going to be a very tight spin, Cipollini trying to come through as well now, Cipollini on the barriers, he's got the wheel of Eric Zabel, and this is a rough ride too, but Zabel is going for it now, Manali is with him, Manali and Moncasan, Manali Moncasan to the line, a very tight finish indeed, but Manali thinks he's got it, but my goodness me, that was a close one, I couldn't split it. Let's have another look at this one. There is Frédéric Moncassan searching for the stage win. Manali, the man that won a stage with Tour de France when it was in Britain a couple of years ago. He's right alongside Frédéric Moncassan and Cipollini couldn't get through. Paul, just have a look at this. Well, that's quite remarkable. You can see the speed of Nicola Manali coming up there on the left in the blue. There was a little bit of a switch from Zabel in the green, which I think slowed down Mario Cipollini in the yellow. Moncassin using a huge gear on the left-hand shoulder of Benali tries to come up at the very last minute, but it all goes down to the lunge for the line, and both of these riders lunging at almost the same time. I think the mistake from Moncassin came that he threw his bike just a little bit too soon, and then I think it's going to have to go down to the finish, because as they go over the line, they're almost on the same oh. millimetre, really. Unbelievable. Well, Manali instinctively thrown his hand up. He's claiming the victory, but this is going to go down, I think, as one of the closest finishes on the stage of the Tour de France. The eye cannot split these two riders, and we're trying every camera angle here. But they're crossing the line almost together, but the sense of Manali to throw his hand up, I think he might get it. Look at this. Well, you know, from this angle, to me it looks like Moncassin, but the judges are giving it to Nicola Minali, and they're saying the official distance is four millimetres. And I think they're right. I think the rider on the far side has won the stage. Well, there we are, Nicola Minali, a stage winner by the narrowest margin I can recall, just four millimetres, and that's official. The overall standings after stage four, Cipollini keeps his lead, but by now only four seconds ahead of Zabel. Uh, Chris Borman is still third, and Ulrich still hovering there in fourth. On to stage number five, we're going on an easterly route now from Chantonnet down to La Chartre. And they reckon they'll be in the saddle for around six hours. Well, a sad day too because an accident near the finish yesterday. And this rider, Alex Zuller, he's been on the ground almost every day this week, has decided to retire with that damaged collarbone, literally held together with nuts and bolts. Let's hope he recovers quickly and let's hope he comes back big time for the Tour of Spain. The race continues now to roll on out of town and this is a good stage today. It's a new town for the start and a new town for the finish as far as the Tour de France is concerned. And still in that yellow jersey is Mario Cipollini. And the man who's made the early move is Cedric Vasseur. He's making a long shot. Now, can he get enough time here to win this stage? Because if he wins with a big margin, he will take over the yellow jersey and that will be something of a surprise. Well, a brave man to go out on roads like these because they're very long and very straight and the wind is up as well because that's going to be difficult for him over the final kilometres. So the field is all together, but this first week of the Tour highlighted by crashes. So let's go to Gary Imlach now, who can sum up just what a tough week it's been in this first week of the Tour de France. Over to you, Gary. Last year it was the roundabouts of Holland. This year it's the narrow roads of northern France. But whatever the scenery of the accident, the first week of the Tour always seems to be a week of crashes. Well, there is a big pile-up. People are just going berserk. Looks like a Seiko ride has gone down. We're battle of survival. Rides have gone off to the right into the ditch here. It's crazy, isn't it? The first week of the tour is always jittery with a full complement of riders and not enough miles in their legs to calm them down and string them out. The consensus in the peloton seems to be that this year things are worse. There's many factors, the roads, the speed, 200 guys and all those things. I think there's too many people on too smaller roads and, you know, and everyone's really nervous. You survive the first week without crashing, the second week you're going to be okay. In fact, it's a clear sign that the situation is getting out of hand when non-climbers are looking forward to the Pyrenees. Last year was the same thing, I remember, just 
very nerve-wracking. I mean, when, when you got finally got to the mountains, it was a relief to get to the mountains because then finally you're able to just be in your little group and and ride, you know, for me, riding alone, but with other guys riding with a smaller group. For some reason, the whole season so far seems to have had more than its quota of crashes. In Milan San Remo, Laurent Jalabert brought down Britain's Max Chiantri in the final sprint. And Abraham Alano's attempt to warm up for the Tour with a win in the Dauphiné Libre ended up down the side of a hill. The Tour of Italy in particular had enough crashes for a compilation video. The most embarrassing being Alexander Schaefer headbutting a snack bar in a less than tight bend and the nastiest looking Luc Leblanc hitting the wall. The unluckiest rider in the race though had to be Marco Pantani. Having missed most of last year after an encounter with a car, he was brought down by a black cat and like Leblanc he had to abandon. Of course the history of the Tour is littered with crashes and quite a few of them have decided the outcome of the race. In 1951, Wim van Es, the first Dutchman to wear the yellow jersey, became the first to lose it when he went down a ravine on the Col d'Aubisque. It was bad news for his team too, because their entire supply of spare inner tubes was tied together to pull him up, forcing them to abandon as well. In 1971, Lewis Acania was leading the race when he missed a bend, hit a spectator and broke his collarbone, effectively handing Eddie Merckx the third of his five tours. More recently, of course, Rolf Sorensen crashed out in yellow during the 91 tour. And Chris Boardman famously lost the chance to take it when he lost control in the rain at Saint-Brieuc during the 1995 prologue. For drama, you can choose from crashes at either end of tours in the 90s. Orange Jalabert's in 94, when a policeman officially didn't step out in front of the peloton, at least according to the police, on stage one. And Jamaluddin Abdul Jafarov's spectacular collision with a coke bollard within 50 yards of the finish on the Champs Elysees three years earlier. For sheer courage, though, nothing matches Bernardino's refusal to give up the yellow jersey in 1985. Despite breaking his nose in a nasty fall close to the finish in Saint Etienne, he finished the stage and went on to win the last of his five tours. And all of those riders did recover from those horrific injuries. Well, this is the sprint now at Nervi Saint Sepulchre, 245 kilometres covered. Seven minutes ahead is Vasseur, but this is the sprint for second place. The battle for that green and yellow jersey goes on. Zorbel just about nipping that one off Cipollini. But Paul Vasseur, who broke away at around 114 kilometres, he had a lead of nearly 18 minutes. He's still over seven minutes clear. Well, it's a bit crazy, these two riders sprinting for bonuses of around about two seconds because at the moment they should get their teams together and organise the chase behind. They're fighting out really as if this is the win at the end of the stage because they're so close, pushing themselves a long way ahead. It just goes to Zabel on the line and Chipper will take third place. Well, the race has gone on because the GAN rider, Cedric Vasseur, whose father, by the way, Alan Vasseur, had a breakaway similar to this back in 1970, I think it was, Paul, and he won the stage. His father was a great rider when it came to those lone breakaways, in fact winning a stage of the Tour de France, but if Cedric Vasseur can keep the time gap that he's got at the moment, 6 minutes and 25, he will have something that his father never had, and that's a yellow jersey in the Tour de France. Right, well at the moment Vasseur started the day 21st overall, 1 minute and 37 seconds behind Mario Cipollini, and I don't think Cipollini expected to lose the lead today, but right now I don't think equally so that Vasseur expected to get the lead, but it's beginning to look possible. Yes, he is showing signs of fatigue, and you know if he survives all the way to the line, he'll have been alone in the lead for 147 kilometres, and this is not a flat route today, it rolls all the way. You can see now he knows that he's got the stage victory. He wants now to try and conserve as much of that time as possible, forcing himself to keep going. This is the time when he will get some energy from somewhere else, some energy just from his courage and determination just to keep those legs going around. But a brilliant move by this man, and I think he's going to be so happy when he sees that line finally because he's been waiting for it for around about three and a half hours. So, a very interesting tour in this opening week, and now it looks as though he's going to get it. He knows it. He's going to spend a little time throwing kisses around here. As Cedric Vasseur is going to become the surprised leader of the Tour de France. He's still approximately two and a half minutes to the good at the last time check. There's a chance to see what happens on television back in northern France. That's Dad Alain, who used to race on the big team, and he's commentating, actually, on his son crossing the line live. Cedric Vasseur becomes the new leader of the Tour de France because here is the race for second place the Australian Stuart O'Grady is going to make it a 1-2 for Gann and look at the gap 2.32 so Vasseur is confirmed as the leader 
and Cabello of the Kelme team was third, but that was a superb result and cleaning up for the rest the two big sprinters, Cipollini and Zabo, but it won't matter now, three minutes and 24 seconds back. Well, a brilliant day for Cedric Vasseur, one that will go down in the history books, but now he has a yellow jersey to contend with, and I'm sure they will make him rise to the occasion. He celebrates the crowds here. He knows that that is a great victory for himself and also for the Gann team. It's their second yellow jersey in the tour after that of Christopher Boardman and Cipollini, the big loser at 2.17, Eric Zabel at 2.19, and Borman, his own teammate, back in fourth place. Jan Ulrich, though, Phil, all of the time well up there in fifth. And on the day that Alex Zuller didn't start, only 192 riders left in the race. Hello and welcome to the seventh day of the Tour de France. Well, yesterday we concentrated on the battle between the sprinters and instead it was a young Frenchman, Cédric Vasseur, who broke clear, won the stage and took the race lead. What went wrong among the sprinters? How did Vasseur escape? Well, before we join the action, here's Paul showing with his opinion. Cedric Vasseur got clear of the pack yesterday for one simple reason. They let him. It was a good solution for everyone. He would take the big time bonuses along the way. As he built up a lead that exceeded 17 minutes, an interesting game of chess was being played out behind. The lone leader would take the pressure off the battle between Mario Cipollini and Eric Zabel for the yellow jersey. I think that Mario Cipollini's psycho team had lost a little confidence in him. He was being repeatedly beaten in the sprints by Zabel, so they were happy to let the breakaway succeed and take the time bonus sprints. On the other hand, if Telecom wanted to have Zabel in yellow, then they would have to chase. Bjarne Ries, the team leader, decided he didn't want to have a short-term yellow jersey and ordered Telecom not to work. The result? Nobody chased and Vasseur gave the French a victory and a yellow jersey. The big losers on the day, Mario Cipollini and Eric Zabel. No more yellow dreams for them. And for the moment, not for Bjorn Arish, last year's tour winner either. He's still looking for 3 minutes and 59 seconds, although I don't think, Paul, he'll be too concerned about the whereabouts of Cedric Vasseur. He might be a little bit more concerned about the place of Jan Ulrich, fifth overall at the moment, 2.56 down on the Frenchman, and probably his most serious contender. Ulrich were in the championship of Germany, the jersey he won just before this tour started. Here's Abraham Alano, another one of the pre-race favourites, hasn't shown a lot yet, waiting for the mountains I think, he's just over three minutes off the pace. The field now heading down to the beautiful west coast of France, uh, heading to Marenne, 217 kilometres today, the winds are blowing again Paul, and they have caused one or two problems. Here's Eros Poli setting the pace but a big change in the tactics of the race because now it's the Gann team in the white jerseys who have to do all of the work at the front. Two-pronged attack for them really because they want to keep the yellow jersey on the shoulders of Cédric Vasseur and if it does come down to a sprint at the finish then there's a chance for Frédéric Moncassin to take the stage. Well, even I could have kept up with the first two hours of the pace today. 30 kilometres an hour, Paul, that's around about 19 miles an hour. So I think uh, they switched off a little bit now because the sprinters have lost their grip on this tour. And now other riders are going to think how they can plan. And what a list now. Here is yet another crash on the road. Riders have gone into the ditch left and right of the road and completely come to a stop. Well, Phil, I've never seen so many crashes in the Tour de France, and I'm sure it's the fact that riders are taking risks to ride in the first 20 or 30 positions, and all of the time, people going down. In fact, Cipollini's one of the men involved. Mario Cipollini, now in red, is down as well, and not looking too contented at all now. So Cipollini caught this time, and a lot of riders taking a little while to get away here. At least Cipollini's got a couple of teammates back there. Well, one of them is Massimiliano Lelli and the other one's Paolo Fornacciari. They're going to wait for Cipollini and try and get him back into the main field. Lelli, by the way, the winner of recently of the US Pro Championships in Philadelphia. I won't be too happy with the speed. Cipollini's getting himself ready for departure here because it's going to be a tough chase down now, but he's away. There's the long empty road ahead. A lot of team cars have already gone forward here. Cipollini's a meatball. Looks as though he's not too happy with the way he's riding. He looks in a little bit of pain, he doesn't look fluid, he hasn't got himself going quickly and they'll have a hard time getting back into the main field because the main field riding this quickly doesn't wait for anyone. Well now we've got up to the main field and this is the sprint for the finish here in Maren. And looking over his shoulder there's a Rabobank rider, I think it's Rolf Sorensen looking probably to see where Robbie McEwen is. There's an awful lot of movement in this bunch here, they're all over the road. 
But leading out now, we've got Laurent Gentil of the Big Mat team. Zorbel is on his wheel here. Abdou Japarov is trying to get on terms. Cipollini's got back to this group, but he's not in the hunt really. He's over to the left at the moment. Abdou Japarov going forward now, and it looks as though it's going to be Eric Zorbel who'll get it. And I think Tom Steele has just hurled his water bottle at somebody in the centre of the pack. But as they come clear to the line, Zorbel gets the victory. Second will be Jerome Blylevens, I think, and Abdou Japarov third. Let's have a look at the order over the line again. Zabel notching his 15th win of the season here as Blylevens comes clear for second. Now the judges have disqualified Zabel and also Tom Steeles. Tom Steeles from the race itself, Zabel from the win. So let's join Paul Sherwin to take us through what was a very dodgy finish indeed. This is how the judges saw the finish, to begin with a fairly normal sprint, but then Rolf Sorensen in the orange jersey for Rabobank leaps across at 35 miles an hour to the opposite side of the road. First incident on the right hand side, the green jersey of Zabel and Cipollini come together, bouncing off each other. The judges would let that one go, that wasn't too serious. But then Eric Zabel feels somebody moving by him on the left, he leaps across to that wheel because he knows that's the one he wants. But this is the incident they didn't like. He butts into the rider with his head there and they decided that was dangerous riding and they relegated him to last position in the pack. First man over the line, last in the pack and the victory was given to your own Blylevens. However, on the other side of the pack, something else was going on. Tom Steele's the Belgian champion, fighting it out with Frederick Moncassin in the white. Now these two riders want to get into the slipstream of Mario Cipollini, they're bumping against each other consistently, nobody wants to give up, but in fact it's Steeles who manages to go round even though Gan rider Moncassant nearly falls off. Steeles has lost his impetus and also his stability, he falls onto the shoulder there of Travisoni, but he's lost all chance of a win, he gets mad, he takes out his bid on at 40 miles an hour and hurls it at the Frenchman. That's what the judges didn't like, they said it was aggression against another competitor and they threw him straight away out of the race. And the sensations don't stop there as we now tune up for stage seven, Marin to Bordeaux, the field being flagged away with Cedric Vasseur in the Maillot Jaune, but not coming out to the race start this morning was Evgeny Berzin, the Russian rider, although he got to the finish yesterday, realized he had broken his collarbone. Out too with a damaged neck is the man who won the Tour of Italy, Ivan Gotti, another non-starter. While Mario Cipollini, we saw him crash, well an injured knee, he too has abandoned the Tour de France today. Three big names have gone from this tour, there's another one as well, Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov, who was said to have given a positive drugs test earlier in the stage of this race has been disqualified, so he's gone home. As always, Phil coming into the final few kilometres, Team Telecom at the front trying to set it up for their sprinter Eric Zabel. And this time again it's the turn of Jan Ulrich in the white jersey as the champion of Germany. Well, there's no doubt, Paul, that Zabel is very upset about the decision to relegate him last night from that victory. He felt he'd done nothing wrong. The judges saw otherwise. This group has again been split by a crash. Jens Heppner was the faller. But now we're looking at about 64 riders lining up for the finish here. And you're right, Ulrich is working well here, looking for Zabel. A lot of teams trying to get their sprinters up there too. A former winner here in Bordeaux as well, Frederic Moncassin. Abdou Japarov won here in 1994, but unfortunately he's been sent home early. You're absolutely right as we go under the banner there. And this is a superb finish here. The whole of Bordeaux, I think, has turned out to watch the riders come in down the side of the River Gironde. And now the sprints are starting for the line here. La Française de Jeu. He's trying to break it up a little bit, but they've marked him well. Bjorn Aris himself has got control at the front now. He's looking better every day of this tour. As Reese is thinking of Zabel, there he is, lying four men down the line. Easy to pick out in that green jersey. Zabel wants this for very special reasons now. He's not worried about anything else. The win he wants to make sure the judges get it right. Well, the team have put him in a great position. There's Frankie Andreu trying to get a place for himself for the coffee and his team as well. But Zabel's right in the slipstream, but it looks now as if he's been boxed in. He's in second. So Zabel in second, but he's got a lovely smooth lead out for the line. Look at his face now as Zabel kicks with all his weight there. Moncassan, long way back. Blylevens is behind too. This isn't going to be. That's Kersey Poo trying to challenge. Jan Kersey Poo, but Zabel gets revenge. He gets the victory in Bordeaux, as in fact he did back in 1995. But this one was rather special for him. So Eric Zabel gets the victory as we see it here. Jan Kersipu makes an appearance at last, the sprinter on the Casino team. And Jerome Blylevens again, not quite having the strength necessary to get the kick that turns third place into a win. 
and Robbie McEwen, he's the Australian rider in his first tour. He crosses the line in fourth place. But that was the important one today for him, Eric Zabel getting the win he wanted. This is the overall situation after seven stages in the prologue. Cedric Vasseur leads by a minute and 49 seconds, Eric Zabel. He keeps nibbling off with the time bonuses. Chris Borman up there in third place. On to stage eight now, a so turn to Poe, the gateway to the Pyrenees at just 100 miles, 161 and a half kilometers, 186 riders are left in. Certainly through some of the most beautiful wine country of the world, the French Bordeaux region and this area they're leaving from Sauterne makes a very clear white sweet wine. If you've got a chance to take some dessert, well I think you should try it. That's allowed, but some things aren't. The current drug of choice in cycling is EPO. In simple terms, EPO is a drug that mimics the effects of altitude training by raising the number of red cells in the blood. And there's the problem because medically it's impossible to tell the difference between a cyclist who's been up a mountain and one who's been down the chemist. So although dope tests carried out daily at the stage finish are fine for detecting the usual scientific suspects, they're no good for EPO. And here's where things get interesting because the riders themselves were so concerned about EPO that they gave their support to a creative compromise. This season, in addition to drug testing, cycling's ruling body, the UCI, has also introduced what it calls health testing. And any rider with a red blood cell count over 50% is prevented from competing for his own welfare. Not banned, just sent away until his blood is back to what the UCI considers normal and healthy. They take a little blood, a little blood sample and uh, they measure it, and uh, if you're over 50, then you uh, you have two weeks to to lower it again. So I think it's a it's a good measure. All the riders are are together in the fact that they want this to be a healthy sport, and they want you know they know that they're they have lives up after cycling. So everybody wants to make sure that uh, we are we're healthy professionals. So far this season, 10 riders have been sent home for the good of their health, including former King of the Mountains Claudio Chiappucci. In the first week of the tour, though, four teams have been tested all below the limit. But the system isn't without its critics. Some riders think the ceiling has been set too low, particularly for riders like Colombia's Chepi Gonzalez, who live at altitude. No solamente nosotros, sino habrá muchos más que manejarán eh, pues niveles altos de matoprito, ¿no? Entonces la UCI tendrá que hacer un estudio muy concreto a, a los corredores colombianos. But 50 is low. But for people who are living on sea level, I think uh, there are little problems. And I, in my career, I've seen no rider with a level of over 50 during competition. The other criticism is that with this new blame-free approach, the UCI is ducking the moral issue by not even trying to distinguish between the dopers and the naturally high. Not to make light of the whole issue, but you know there is a controlled substance on public sale at the stage start every morning. Four strong cups of coffee will put you over the UCI limit, although as with all drugs, there are well-documented side effects. And now back to the action here, and the riders concentrating on the finish in Po after that 100 miles. And so far, the race has been pretty nippy. The first hour they covered, Paul, nearly 49 kilometers today. And despite several attempts at breakaways, it's all come back together for the final sprint. And again, Phil, it's Jan Ulrich on the front with one kilometer remaining, trying to set it up for Eric Zabel one more time. Well, this is the last day before the mountains begin, and after that we're going to find this, I think, to be one of the hardest tours in modern times. So this is the last day for the sprinters, and they've fought hard to keep this race together. Zabel has got two wins under his belt. He's right in the hunt again, and once more, Jan Ulrich, he seems to be a tower of strength this year, swinging off as Bjorn Reese takes them around the corner. It's amazing to see the amount of work that Bjarne Ries has done in this first week of the Tour de France because tomorrow he's going to have to turn around and reinstall himself as the leader of the pack. Absolutely right, but now they're thinking only the sprint of 400 metres to go and the telecom boys are again catapulting Eric Zorbel towards the line but watch out because Nicola Minali is mixing in and again Jerome Blyleven still looking for a real win because he's only got one by disqualification. But now Zabel goes for the line and doesn't seem anybody to stop him now. As Manali comes, Moncasan in the white and Blylevens, but they're not going to get on terms. Eric Zabel, that is a win at number 16 this season for him. He's equaled Mario Cipollini as the two top winners so far of 1997. And that was a clean sprint for sure. Well, there was over 130 riders in this sprint. There's still a few off the back today, some 50 left behind. But there's how he does it. 
kicks very strongly past his teammate here. Minali a little bit slow out of the blocks, I think, but then he came at him quite well. Moncasan also left far too far down the field, having to come over the top of Jerome Blylevens, and I'm not too sure he actually will get over the top of Blylevens. He won't. So for the second day in succession, Blylevens takes third place, and equally so, the win going to Eric Zabel. He'll tell you he's had four wins in the Tour this year, but of course, officially, it's only three. Close, but not quite as close as when Manali got the verdict by four millimetres over Moncassin, but still, it's a good job we have photo finish equipment on the Tour de France these years. Quite remarkable to see the power of this man, Eric Zabo. Once he sees the finishing line, he just opens it up, and I think he owes a very big thank you to Giovanni Lombardi, who they brought across to the team this year. He certainly has been able to set him up perfectly. Learned a lot of his skill on the track scene because he is Olympic champion at the points race, but really quite remarkable the way Eric Zabo seems to time it just right. Well, that's the ability of being a perfect sprinter, of course, and Zabel now 16 wins this season, beating Manali, Blylevens, Moncasan and Laurie Os of the casino team getting up there in fifth place in what is his first Tour de France. So, after nine days of cycling and no bigger hill than a fourth category, we are now about to cross into the giants of the Pyrenees, the bridge between France and Spain. The mountains are with us, the big names must fight. And it's a beautiful day here at the finish at Loudan Vielle, but you know the weather here in the Pyrenees can change very quickly. However, we do expect Bjorn Rees to put in his challenge. At this stage last year, Rees was already the leader, and ahead of him in Denmark was the biggest welcome any sportsman had ever been given. Cycling has since become Denmark's number one sport, and thanks to Bjorn Rees, most of Denmark will be watching television today. You know, he's naturally a quiet man, and when Paul Sherwin spoke to him, he certainly wasn't giving much away about his plans or that of the team. <laughs> it's pretty normal. Are you happy with the way the team is? They, they are the best team in the Tour for the moment. Yeah, it's a good team. We win and we're satisfied. I was talking to one of your friends from Luxembourg yesterday and he said your biggest adversary is going to be Bjarne Ries. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Well, perhaps he is feeling the pressure after all. Well, let's join the action now as we start the climb of the Col de Tourmalet. The two riders out in front here are Javier Pasquale from Kelme and Pascal Hervé from Festina. A little bit of mist and fog on the climb as we come up towards the summit and still these two riders are clear. Well, I think Pascal Hervé is trying to set the race up for his own teammate Richard Vironque because these riders from Festina have always been aggressive in the mountains and Richard Vironque has always been very successful in the Pyrenees. Well, Hervé, a good rider in his own right, but look at the conditions here now as they do come up over the top. It's Pasquale who goes over first. Hervé sits up there getting himself ready for the descent. Here comes Richard Vironque and he's actually climbing in a small group of riders here, including his teammate Laurent Dufault. So the third and fourth, Ulrich is here and so too is Ries. So the top four riders in the Tour de France last year are in this group just 20 seconds back. And Richard Verenck looking very comfortable, I'm sure, thinking about a victory later in the day. But one man thinking about survival is the yellow jersey, Cedric Vasseur, suffering on every climb of the day so far, Phil, but always fighting his way back. The courage, I think, of the yellow jersey pushing him along. Well, he was in trouble on the Col de Soulor as well, but he got back to the group and he's not too far away from them as he continues to climb up the Tourmalade. Out uh, of the, not out of the race, but out of the hunt for the yellow jersey now, Chris Boardman, who was third this morning. He's crashed on the descent of the Col de Soulor and he's actually in the autobus now with all the sprinters, so he's going to lose big time today. But Cedric Vasseur has to take a lot of risks to try and pull himself back into the lead and keep the yellow jersey. But one man missing from this year's Tour de France is Lance Armstrong and he decided to come and see the race in the Pyrenees. So let's catch up with his news. Lance, in case you didn't know, was diagnosed with cancer last October, shortly after signing for the French Cofidis team. And although the cancer is now thankfully in remission, he hasn't yet been able to return to competition. You're still a member of the Cofidis team, got a contract with them. How do you see your future in racing? Good question. I, I don't know. We have to just wait and see. My doctors have told me to, to rest this year, and so whatever happens after this year, then, then it's going to happen. But I still consider myself a, a professional cyclist. 
And so too does this man, the leader of the King of the Mountains, Laurent Brochard, as we start now the final climb of Val Laurent before we go down to the finish at Ludon Viel. Now Brochard has had a great day so far here in the Pyrenees. He was first over the top of the Col de Soulor after 50 kilometers, and he's been second over the top of the Col d'Aspin. Pascal Hervé just survived to stay first there, but now both the early breakaways have been caught. Well, Brosha are certainly trying to put a lot of pressure on Bjarne Rees today. They feel that there is a chink in the armour of the Dane, and this is where it is. It's in the mountains, which is why they're attacking like this. And the new champion of Germany looking very, very cool indeed here. The same cannot be said of Bjarne Rees. He looks to be suffering in the mountains. We didn't really expect this. I think a lot of riders taken by surprise this mountain here, the Col de Val Laurent, is very steep indeed. In fact, only a few months ago it was just a cattle track and they put down this special tarmac road just for the Tour de France. A little bit of a back road, but it was here in 1991 where we first heard about Miguel Indurain as he laid the foundations for his first Tour victory. The stage also being won on that occasion by Claudio Chiapucci. That was his first ever a big stage race victory. Great to see in this group as well, Marco Pantani has come back after the terrible accidents he's had over his career. The first one in 1995, Milan Torino, and even having to withdraw from the Tour of Italy. But the man suffering like a dog is still Cedric Vasseur, but Phil, he keeps coming back on the descent. He yo-yos back on, you know, he's not completely out of that yellow jersey yet, if he can pull something rather special out before the finish. Now, Richard Varenk still annoying everybody. Quick acceleration by this little man who loves to antagonise anywhere, not just in the mountains. He rides rather, reminds me of Claudio Chiapucci, the way he annoys everybody. But now, look at the cool way that Ulrich has sailed up to him, and the man not there, Paul, is Rhys. Well, Rhys looked as if he was suffering an awful lot just a few moments ago, can't respond to this attack. I think probably not panicking, realising that Virenk attacks and keeps lifting up the pace. And what Rhys will try and do is, I think, come back slowly and not put himself into too much pressure. But you can see he's gone off the back of the group. It's not good signs. This is Marco Pantari who's come up, though. Elefantino has made the contact and still looking pretty confident. It's the first time we've really seen Bjarne Nerys under pressure. He's looked so good in the Tour de France so far. He's been leading out the sprints, doing a lot of work on the flat stages. But now it looks as if he really can't really match these top climbers in the Pyrenees. Well, now the captain has taken over. He's passed his teammate, uh, Laura Brochard. So Richard Varenk perhaps going to start staking a claim to a fourth win in the King of the Mountains competition. The only man ahead of him is Brochard who says he's minding the jersey for his team leader. Well, we're going to find out. But Pantani's got other ideas here. The top of Val Laurent. Marco Pantani is flexing his legs. And the real Verenk will not like that, but he's lost it because he's gone over the top in second place. Ulrich third. Brochard is fourth. And we're waiting now for a time check on the whereabouts of Bjorn Arise. And Pantani isn't waiting. Well, it's great to see Marco Pantani is finally back because there, in fact, further down the course, 27 seconds to Bjorn Arise. And with him is Escartin, and I tell you what, Pantani taking a lot of risks, nearly losing it in that corner. Well, he certainly is. Uh, that was a crazy right-hand turn there, but he wants to open the gaps now. They don't seem too concerned that they're towing uh, young uh, Jan Ulrich with them here, the revelation of the tour last year. Two minutes, 49 seconds for the Mayo Jean. He still has a chance of hanging on here. The Mayo Jean and Cedric Vasseur, who was around about two minutes down at the start, He's still in with a real chance, and the team car knows it here. Roger Leger it was, who's saying, look, keep on doing this, and you could still keep that yellow jersey. Well, it's a downhill finish, a very treacherous one too, and Vasseur has proved all along today that he can come back on the descent. He'll not make up the whole amount of that deficit, but he can certainly pull some of it back. Well, Ulrich is the man who's the big danger. He's lying two, fifth, two minutes 58 behind Cedric Vasseur. So at this moment in time, Vasseur is doing just enough to keep the lead. And Richard Virenk now is the man starting to take the risks here in the corners, followed by Ulrich and Pantani decided to take up third position now. But it's amazing how well this climber goes downhill because normally a climber is not reputedly a good descender, but Virenk is certainly taking a lot of risks with five kilometers remaining. And most of that five kilometres is downhill now to this new finish for the Tour de France. A beautiful little place it is too. It's tucked away in the valley with the Pyrenees all around it. And it's been a great day of racing today. The strong men who felt they could win this Tour de France on the attack. And this man here, Laurent Brochard, he's been attacking all day. He's been dropped just now. He's coming back. 
He's taken a lot of risks. He was only 23 seconds down at the top of the climb, and with a bit of luck, he'll get onto the back wheel of these three leaders. And that, of course, is going to help Richard Varenk because that means he's got a mate up here who will not help. Ulrich seems to be desperately trying to control this race at the front, almost as if he's trying to slow it down to await the arrival of Bjorn Aris. I think that's why he keeps looking over his shoulders. He realises Bjarne Ries wasn't too far behind at the top of the climb there, and all he wants is for his team leader to come back up to him, which is why he's currently sitting in second position. But look at the speed of Brosha. He's got back right in the town, and I think there's around about three kilometres remaining. Great bike riding by Brosha. He's come right back to three men. He thought he'd seen the last of not very many kilometres ago. I think that was the three kilometres to go, Banner Paul, and now a little kick uphill again. And Brochard has latched onto the back of Pantani and looks as though he's anxious to get right through onto the wheel of Ulrich. Well, I think he wants to go to the front and work a little bit with Virenk because he realises this is a chance for Richard Virenk to open up some time gaps over Bjarne Ries and now Brochard is moving forward. Moving forward and is he going to go for it? He's come right over the top of Ulrich. Now, in fact, Virenk is in second wheel here. He's trying to back off the other two and give Brochard a chance. Well, that's a great move by them, because if it does go down to this group going to the finish, I'd give all the chances to Jan Ulrich. He's certainly the fastest man here, and not too far behind, Bjarne Aris. He's coming up with another Festina rider on his wheel, that's Laurent Dufault, and a little bit of help from the man in green, Fernando Escartin. Well, I still got him pegged at around 35 seconds, so he may have lost a few seconds on the way down, because Pantani and co did take one or two risks on that descent, but look at the gap now, and you know they're going to allow him to go? Well, that's remarkable, Phil. You see Jan Ulrich playing the perfect teammate. He isn't chasing down Brosha because he realises if he does peg him back, then somebody else will attack. He wants to sh slow down Virenk because all he wants is for Ries to come back. He's just sitting there, leaving it up to the Frenchman. Well, if Laurent Brosha wins this, you'll have to admit he deserves it. But what a way to win a stage. The first day in the mountains, he looked to me as though he's finished about 10 kilometres ago. He's clawed his way back, as Rhys has yet to do, and he looks like he's going clear. Two men fighting for their lives now. Bjorn Rhys, last year's tour winner and the current tour leader. And that man, Paul, is seconds away from retaining that yellow jersey, not losing it. It's going to be very close for Cedric Vasseur, but the man really pushing himself to the limits now is this man, Laurent Brochard. I don't know where he's getting the force from because he's been away all day. He's been over the mountains trying to keep the lead in the King of the Mountains competition just for one more day. And his teammate, Richard Virenk at the front of that group there just slowing them down but this rider has turned his day of defeat into one of success by just joining the leaders and immediately attacking Laura Brochard is going to get his first stage win ever in a Tour de France a man who's having his best ever season and this confirms it now the clock will start counting as the race continues to come in behind now can Richard Virenk make it a one-two for Festina it's certainly been their day, their first day in the Pyrenees, and Pantone is going to have a go at Varenk, but still, Jan Ulrich doesn't want to play. Second, though, for Varenk, third Pantone, and fourth Ulrich. Here comes Rhys. His loss is 41 seconds on the leader today. So he's lost a bit of time. Abraham Alano is in this group as well. He's also conceding more than a minute, but it's the yellow jersey now. If he finishes inside three minutes and 10 seconds, he will keep the yellow jersey. It is going to be very close to Cedric Vasseur as Pascal Lino leads him towards the line, but he's done it and he deservedly has kept that yellow jersey. What a great show of defiance, 2.57 down. And confirmation of the win for Laurent Brochard ahead of his own teammate Richard Vironc by 14 seconds. But Marco Pantani, well, he's back in third. For the next stage in the Pyrenees, 252 kilometres and Vasseur still in yellow. It was a sensational start in the mountains for the Tour de France yesterday. It left us all wondering what will day two in the Pyrenees bring? Will Cedric Vasseur still lead in Andorra tonight? Will Bjorn Aris lose more time? Or will Aris become second player to young teammate Jan Ulrich? Simply brilliant yesterday. Indeed, have we seen the return of Marco Pantani? Or is this the year of the Festina team? And will the Tour de France have a French winner in Richard Berenc? And you know, the big climb here to the top of this mountain above Andorra may give us the answer to some, if not all, of those questions, because this is an absolute brute. It's an all-category climb. It's one that's rarely used in the Tour de France. It will cause a lot of riders a lot of pain. 
After that first day in the Pyrenees, though, this is the situation this morning. Cedric Vasseur keeping his yellow jersey by just 13 seconds over Jan Ulrich. Alano is up to third, Rees is up to fourth, Varenk is up to fifth. The other big names, Laurent Brochard now up to tenth, Marco Pantani comes in the frame at fifteenth. So the riders now rolling away as they start stage number 10, heading now for the Arcalis in Andorra. We haven't been there since 1964. But the riders deciding themselves on the Col de Porte d'Aspe Paul to stop and pay homage to Fabio Casatelli. Well, that's why they rode so slowly over the first few kilometers, and Fabio Casatelli's father and mother came down for this occasion as well, as did his wife Annalisa. Casatelli dying in the race on the descent of the Porte d'Aspe in 1995. In fact, the riders climbing up the way the race had gone down in that fateful year. Well, in fact, Casatelli's father riding all the way from Lake Como it took him something like three days, Paul. And right now, the race has started again, and not too much interest in getting on with the action either. Well, not until they reached the Port Don Villara, just on the outskirts of Andorra, a 36-kilometer climb, and once again, Phil, it's the Festina squad trying to put the pressure on Bjarne Reese. Well, this is an amazing mountain. It's on big, wide roads, and it climbs so high. But again, Bjorn Reese is still in a little bit of trouble here, Paul, as we head up towards the Spanish frontiers, or rather the Andorran frontiers, the Little Republic, which is sandwiched between Spain and France. And uh, Reese is coming back to the league group, but he's not riding like his old self, is he? Well, this is the second time he's been dropped there. He waited for the riders to group together at the front, slow down, and then he used all of his power to come back up. But over the last two days, he really has shown that he is weak in the mountains, which is why we're always seeing the blue and white jerseys of Festina at the front, putting the pressure on, attacking him when they can. Here's Jan Ulrich. He's fallen back for a word with everybody because he certainly is not in any trouble. He's been down to his team car. He just pedals back up to this league group as if they're out on a Sunday touring run. But nice to see there, number 67, Kevin Livingstone riding with the big riders of the Tour de France. A great climber, Kevin, riding his first Tour de France. And I wonder what he's thinking at the moment, looking at all these stars. I hope he's not too starstruck because he's on one of the big climbs of this year's Tour. It's a very good road surface. It keeps on going. We've climbed through the gate already. We're now officially in Andorra. It's a beautiful little principality as the riders continue now. Very tightly packed. Laurent Dufo, Jan Ulrich, Richard Varenk off to the right. We've got uh, Casa Grande in that red jersey. This is a good group now, and these poor, probably, Paul, are going to the men who will take this tour right into the Alps as well. Well, certainly just on the back there in the orange jersey, Peter Luttenberger. Another very good climber, Casa Grande on the right there in the red jersey for Seiko. A revelation, I think, in this year's Tour de France. The Italian said he would be good, and he is confirming that he is. Now, Varenk is trying to go for the King of the Mountains here, about gathering enough points, and he gets easily over the top with hardly an effort from the rest. Uh, Dufo was second, Casa Grande went over there in third place, but the rest were right on his wheel. Now it's a long, fast descent right down towards Andorra itself, but just before we get into the city, we swing right, and we've got two more climbs before the finish line. Very difficult ones too, the Col d'Ordino, and then the final ascent up to the uh, ski resort of Arcalis. Tortuous descent just down the top of the envelier. 10 kilometers to go here now. And we've got the yellow jersey again in trouble. But he keeps on coming back. But I'm not too sure there's much more fight left in Cedric Vasseur. He survived by those 13 seconds. Lucky for some yesterday. But now I think the second day in the Pyrenees has had their, told their story. 10 kilometers to go. And more riders here on the course too. This is uh, Fincato. He's just off the, off the front, actually, Paul. He's coming back from the front group here. He was in a leading group of riders of four or five who managed to get away on the descent there. And Cedric Vasseur himself trying to recuperate, trying to get back into the frame. But at the bottom of the climb of Arcalis, the control is all being made by the man in the white jersey, Jan Ulrich. Well, he's constantly looked out for Bjorn Arise, and he still appears to be looking for him now. He's just started the last climb up to the finish. It's still a fair climb, and just as Cedric Vasseur has gone clear, in fact, what happened? Vasseur just got around them, but now that's Fincato behind, and they are just in front of Jan Ulrich. And Ulrich looks to me as though he can contain his enthusiasm no longer. Because I, and Varenk is getting, getting on turns and he needs to because Ulrich now is waiting for no one. He seems to have decided that Bjorn Reese has to be cut adrift. 
Well, I think he got so fed up with the attacks that came coming from Virenk and from Dufo, he realised the best way to defend the lead is in fact to attack. So he's gone out there, he's blown by Cedric Vasseur in the yellow jersey, and now he's on his own with just one man in front. That's Jean-Philippe Dojois from the Mutual Seniman. Well, there's Fincato, he's going backwards, and here comes the little man with the big heart, Marco Pantani has realised it's time to try and get on terms. He's come right up to Richard Varenk on this final climb. The Danish flag on the right is looking a little bit tarnished right now because Rees is again in difficulty. Well, Rees certainly cannot respond to any of these attacks. In fact, the attack originated at the bottom of the climb by Richard Varenk, currently in second position. But then all of a sudden, the man with the white jersey of the champion of Germany just accelerated and went away on his own and now the last man in front of him Jean-Philippe Dojois and very soon I think he too will be history well he took the race to the rest but I'm afraid he's paid the price he took a good look across at Jan Ulrich and if, if he took a good look at his face he can see this man is not under pressure at all Ulrich has waited as much as he could yesterday he was definitely under the command of Bjorn Reese today I guess he's realized that Reese hasn't quite got the legs of 1996. This young man could be racing to the yellow jersey now and he's got to defend that for an awful long time if he wants to win the Tour de France. Well, these two riders are supposed to be climbers. They must be able to do something against the onslaught of Jan Ulrich. The time gap at the moment, 25 seconds to these two riders. And in fact, Bjarne Reese is 45 seconds down on his own teammate, Jan Ulrich. Well, here is a chance to have a look at Bjorn Reese. I wonder what he's thinking now because he's been dropped back into this rear group. He's just ahead of that bunch which is forming behind him. Gave the camera a big stare there. He won't be happy with the camera around him. Not in this situation. Renk and Pantani, two great, great climbers. Pantani, I think, perhaps the better of the two. But they're making no impression at all on this rider. He's only won two races this year, Paul, the national championship and a stage just recently in the Tour of Switzerland, and yet he seems to have timed his form to absolute perfection. Well, I think he was just programmed for the Tour de France this year. He did nothing in the early part of the season, trained in Lanzarote, but one man who was riding exceptionally well until the last couple of days, Cedric Vasseur, in serious difficulty. But, Phil, the power here of Jan Ulrich is quite remarkable. Rarely do you see a man sit so firmly in the saddle on a mountain pass and hold the bottom of the handlebars like that. Well, he was the world champion back in 1993, and since then he's turned professional. He was kept out of the tour until last year. And last year he came in and he finished second. And now he's looking for his first Mayo Jean. There's Abraham Alano, also surprisingly so to us, having a little bit of difficulty here. He's not far from his homeland of Spain. He can expect support. He is now being watched over by Rees. But look at the mask on Rees, the man from Denmark. He really is suffering. He must be going through all kinds of hell on his machine this afternoon. He knows he's got to try and recover this day in the Pyrenees if he wants to win again like he did last year. But Dufo himself suffering. Look at the face on Dufo. He, he really is pushing himself. But all the time, the man at the front, Ulrich, is time trialling. And just look at that. It's the first time that I've seen this climb as well. And I must say, it is a very, very difficult climb indeed. Well, I'm sure that Jan Ulrich, he may have come down looking at it in training, but he will never have raced up this climb, and he's showing it absolute disdain as he comes under four kilometres for the chase group. Remember that Varenk and Pantani are in front, and Ulrich is already heading up to the three-kilometre banner. Ulrich are looking happy with the fact that the cameras are there watching him fall away from the leaderboard, but these two men, both of them great climbers, both of them with two stage victories, in the mountains to their credit and Richard Virenks both were in the Pyrenees. Well this has been a long a cruel day today and by the time the riders get there for many of them they'll have been in the saddle for more than eight hours. Reese being guarded now by Lord Dufour, although I think both are just trying to match one another to get to the top of the mountain because this man is putting time between them now. The last check we had on Bjorn Reese Paul is over two and a half minutes. Quite remarkable. In fact, Virenk and Pantani are at 55 seconds, and Francesco Casagrande, he's at 1.15. But you know, Jan Ulrich today is not only going to take the stage victory at the end of this stage, but also the yellow jersey. And he's heading up towards the finish now for what has got to be his biggest ever victory. Yes, he's been a world amateur champion, but now he's climbed this mountain like the great Eddie Merckx of old, who was also a very young amateur world champion. 
And now, this man seems to have just about everything. Second in the prologue time trial, he's never been caught by any of the crashes over that first opening week, always positions himself well, and today he could not contain his enthusiasm anymore at all. He has gone for it, and he has opened up the gaps. Well, he's no longer a teammate now. He will be the leader of Team Telecom. And at the end of this little straight here, Phil, he's going to be the first German to wear the yellow jersey since Klaus-Peter Thaler did in 1978. And with all respect to Klaus-Peter, who is a really nice guy, he was never a potential winner of the Tour de France. But I think this man is. As he comes up towards the line, he's still sprinting for time, victory and yellow all at the same moment. And he comes up to the end of 252 kilometres. There's the clock. It is almost eight hours. Seven hours and 46 minutes by the time he gets to the line. And Jan Ulrich is going to claim the race leader's yellow jersey. Of that, we are quite confident now. This has been a superb show by the champion of Germany, who now becomes the German leader of the Tour de France. Pantani racing up the mountain. Can he take second? He was beaten by Vrenk last time he tried it, yesterday at the mountain top finish. But this time, maybe it'll be different. He's coming up towards the line. Varenk's not even going to attempt it. And the gap, about a minute and eight seconds. Further down, though, look at the gaps opening here. Bjorn Aris has dropped to Laurent Dufault. In fact, Dufault looks to me as though he's coming back, but not quick enough. 3.22. So there's stage 10 result. It takes some reading this. A minute and eight to Pantani. These are huge time gaps of the quality of the great Jacques Oncretil. And the overall standings now, this is a big gap. Varenki second, but a 2.38 behind. Further down the list, men we used to talk about, like Laurent Jalabert, 24 minutes back. And so, the man in the Mayo Jaune is the leader of the tour now. And for him, it's been one of the greatest moments of his life. Let's join Paul Sherwin now, who's with him. Yeah, and it was an absolutely fantastic day for you today. Yes, uh, I'm very, very happy uh, I win this stage. This is a hard, hard Pyrenees stage and uh, yeah, I'm very happy I uh, have the yellow jersey and... Yeah. I'm sure he is and also another jersey change as we now head back into France. Richard Varenk is the new leader in the King of the Mountains. Well, here he is, the new superstar of the Tour de France, the man who is making all of the headlines in the newspapers here in Andorra this morning. Well, there's nothing new about the telecom team being in charge at this stage of the Tour de France with 11 days to go, but there is something new in the man who is in that yellow jersey, Jan Ulrich. Now, who is the number one on the telecom team? Is it Ulrich or is it Bjorn Aris, the defending Tour champion? Last night, the telecom team had to make some decisions, so Gary Imlach was at their hotel. From the way the mechanics had the bikes set up outside, it looked as though Telecom had two number ones. But manager Walter Hodfrott quickly made it clear that from now on his team would be working for a single leader and it wouldn't be Bjarne hey, Ries. Jan, uh, il est sans discussion le plus fort du tour. Quand il est Pantani, il est Pantani et Virenc qui sont les deux meilleurs grimpeurs du tour. Uh, il a aussi à plus qu'une minute dans la dernière montée. Alors, uh, Il n'y a pas de discussion et dans l'équipe euh, maintenant vous allez voir euh, c'est pas c'est pas encore du temps vous allez voir Bjarne Maurice euh, de parler un peu euh, mais il va mettre en service euh, de Yogi à mon avis il n'y a pas de problème. Perhaps not a problem for the team manager, but to be deposed so comprehensively by a teammate can't have been easy for Reese. Je crois Bjarne il est un peu désolé pour de lui-même quand on gagne le Tour euh, une année avant. Alors aujourd'hui, euh, c'est Yann qui prend la grande option pour gagner le Tour. Alors, euh, mais je crois comme équipier, il est content. C'est pas encore vu, mais c'est un homme qui est très sportif, très fier, qui accepte aussi euh, quand il est battu. Well, I wonder if he does. We're going to find out anyway as the Tour goes on. 178 riders now leaving Andorra. They go out by the way they came in. The difference is, of course, this man is now in the Mayo Jaune, Jan Ulrich. The top of the Port d'Ambalera awaits the riders, and then it's more or less with a few ripples all downhill to Perpignan. And again, as we come up towards the top of the climb, they've climbed it as a bunch, Paul. Not a wheel turned in anger, and over the top of the climb, we've had Richard Berenk. Well, then the real is, the Ryle is realizing now that it is a downhill finish. And at the back of the main field, Maximilian Chandry, 81st overall, more than an hour behind the leader, Jan Ulrich. Can you believe that? But there really hasn't been a stage for Max Chandry. He hasn't appeared in any of the breakaways yet. That's most unlike him. And Chris Borman, who was third as he came into the mountains just three days ago, has now dropped right away from the leaderboard, and he's very disappointed by that. 
the Col de Schule. And cross over this climb here. Again, Berenk is in the thick of the action, followed by Neil Stevens, his teammate. And in fact, the first four riders, Festina, they really are tying up the mountains competition. They certainly are, but as we get a little bit closer to Perpignan, a lot of riders getting frisky with the possibility of a stage victory. And the fact that tomorrow is a day of rest, the riders will be travelling up to Saint Etienne. But after that, of course, is the time trial, and then into the Alps with Alpe d'Huez itself and a new finish at Courchevel. But the attack's now taking place here, the riders trying to shape up the day's racing. The scenery around here is absolutely stunning. Long, thin line of the peloton. Once they got into the streets of Perpignan, Phil, this breakaway had got away. Sitting in third position is Laurent Debien. The first position there with the yellow jersey of Polti is Sergei Uchikov. And the man in the middle is Carlo Finko. Well, these are the remnants of a nine-man breakaway, which got clear. Museo was one of them, but he's dropped out of it now. Two kilometres to go, and it looks as though the telecom team are trying to get themselves back on terms. But they're a few seconds behind, and I don't think they're going to close this gap down. We've got Carlo Finko, Sergei Uchikov, Laurent Debian. It's Debian on the front at the moment. Now Uchikov goes through. Former stage winner of the Tour. In fact, he won at Ravel at the expense of Lance Armstrong a couple of years ago. But Finko feels he's going to have to start the lead out. Well, he's gone a bit soon, and he's realised it. He's sat up. Now, Uchikov is my favourite, Paul. Well, Uchikov is the fastest of these three. Finko has never won a race in his whole career, but Laurent Debien, he's on the comeback trail after having a positive dope test last year in the tour of the four days of Dunkirk. Well, that cost him his place on the GAN squad as well. Now, Finko, this time I think is the real attack. A little bit of a slow realization from the others as Sergei now comes through on the right of our picture. And Uchikov now has got the inside and dancing around the back is Laurent Debian. He's not well known as a sprinter. Little bit of a hook there, I think, from Sergei Uchikov. And in fact, Debian complaining about that as he crosses the line in first place. Hardly seconds have passed by. Here comes the sprint now. Zorba is in the thick of it. So too is Frederic Moncassin, Fabio Baldotto and Traversoli. New faces at the front. But it looks as though Zorba is going to clean up for the green jersey here. He's sprinting so well. On the line now, it's taken in fact by Moncassin ahead of Eric Zabel. Let's have a look at this again though, this is where he leans on Laurent Debian. And Debian, remember, not a pure sprinter, otherwise he probably wouldn't have hesitated there. He'd have just gone through the gap anyway. But I don't think the judges are going to like that at all. And if they continue their trend, I'm afraid Sergei Uchikov is going to be relegated. And as he crosses the line on this slow motion picture, in fact, they are saying they have relegated him. So Uchikov has gone to third place. Debian will be declared the winner. This is the sprint for fourth being taken by Moncassan. This is the incident, Paul. Well, this is what the judges didn't like. They say Sergei Uchikov prevented Debian coming through. And at the end of the day, they gave the victory to the Frenchman Laurent Debian. Carlo Finca, will he be happy with second place? And Uchikov not very happy with third. In fact, uh, that was very modestly put. In fact, he was fuming with third. He felt he should have been given the victory. Overall, no change at all today. And now, the day after the rest day, the riders have moved up into Saint Etienne for a hilly time trial over 55 kilometres. This is stage number 12. Now, can this man fight back into the frame, knowing that his teammate is now the leader of the tour? Well, it'd be interesting to see just what tactics a lot of these riders adopt. Rumour has it that some of them are going to switch bikes halfway around the course. And at the moment, we're looking at the man wearing number 98. And that, in fact, was Cedric Vasseur. And this is Abraham Alano making his start and also didn't have a great run through the Pyrenees, Alano. Back out with Bjorn Aris, who's unaccustomedly a little bit low down the overall classification at the moment. Still to go and about to get the signal. Richard Varenk, the leader now in the King of the Mountains and looking to win that for a record fourth year in a row. Well, Alano looking very comfortable here. He's on a standard machine for the moment. The first part of this course is very hilly indeed. The riders, I think some of them will actually change at the top of the mountain onto the low-profile machines, but it's the day of reckoning for this man. Jan Ulrich about to make the start. Now, can he give his confirmation as to his strength? The best time already finished, by the way, is by Frank Vandenbroek. One hour, 21 minutes and eight seconds. This is the check at point number three at 41 kilometers. Pantani going through very quick time for him. 1409. Well, it certainly does show that this course suits the climbers and it may well be that Richard Virenk can do something special. Time trialling is his weakness, but behind him on the road, this man is really making inroads into the lead of the little Frenchman. 
And sorry about the little bit of picture breakup again. It's those trees on the right which is causing the problems. But now Jan Uric is setting the trend as we go along. Pantani has set the new mark at 1409, much quicker than Van den Broek. And all of the others are slipping behind him. Now Reese is out on the road. And the last man, Varenk and Ulrich, they are the last two on the road. Well, out on the course, Bjarne Reese putting a good time in. He's gone through the 41 kilometre mark in exactly the same time as Marco Pantani. While at the finish line, Fernando Escartin losing a little bit, coming across in seventh place with one hour, 21 minutes, 47. Well, now look at this. Jan Ulrich here is beginning to pick up Richard Varenk. This is going to be a nasty surprise. I don't think Varenk really expected to be caught by Jan Ulrich, but he is firing this man from Germany. He's bridging the gap and we're on the climb here. Now, which side is he going to pass him by? He's not too sure as he dodges around, but Richard Varenk, who's a great climber, has no answer to the pure strength of the German. Well, the final few kilometres here, very fast indeed. And in fact, you can see that Jan Ulrich has changed to a low-profile machine. He's wanting to take advantage of the aerodynamics and try and push himself up to speed over the closing metres. And now Pantani is going to rewrite the leaderboard here. He comes in 1.20.06, confirming his great times out on the course. Marco Pantani in now with the best time. Still Reese Alano, Varenk and Ulrich to finish. But we know now that Varenk has been caught for three minutes by Ulrich, although he's still trying to slip him. Well, Bjarne Reese has faded quite a bit, Phil, over the last few metres, but he is going to go inside the time of Marco Pantani. That's the time to beat. 1 hour 20.06. And Bjarne Reese looks to me as if he's going to come in with the new best time, but he looks very slow coming over the final few metres here, as if he's really having to dig very deep indeed. There it is, new time, 1 hour 19.32. 34 second beating of Pantani as we go back out on the course. This is now the descent, the last 14 kilometers off the top of the mountain and down towards St Etienne. It's quite a tortuous descent, but it's very dry condition today, thankfully so. And uh, now it looks as though this man is setting new trends, but we'll have to find out first if Alana's going to match anybody's time. It's been a good ride by Abraham Alano here. Bjorn Arisa's has got best. I think Abraham Alano might fall just a little bit outside of this. It's a long way up this straight here. Best time is 1.19.32. He's just going to be outside the time of Reese, so he'll go second on the board. So all of the stars are finishing very close together. Well, this man is doing a great fight, Phil. Richard Vireng just in front of him there. He can see Jan Ulrich. He hasn't given up. He's been caught by a superior time trialist, but he's riding on courage. He doesn't want this man to blow him away. Well, Varenk has made a very, very nervous descent down that mountain. He's closed the gap right up on Ulrich, who seemed to be pulling away. Look at this massive crowd here in the cycling capital of France. And now Ulrich is going to confirm he really is a top contender for final honours in this race. Ulrich, his time is amazing. He's way up on Bjorn Aris, his teammate and last year's tour winner. He's three minutes in front, don't forget, of Richard Varenk, who is just behind him now. So he's conceding all of that time as Ulrich is going to set a unique time here that nobody has approached all day. He's going to be minutes quicker than Bjorn Aris. This is going to be a Miguel Indurain style time trial for young Jan Ulrich. 1.16.24, three minutes quicker than Bjorn Aris. That is an amazing result for the German. But you know Richard Varenk's going to be happy, Phil, too, because that time that he will come in with will be good enough for second place. So Richard Varenk did keep at Jan Ulrich in his sights, but he lost three minutes nonetheless, and that's going to take a bit of recuperating, even for a climber in the Alps, which are now to come. And the road ahead really is a tough one now. Richard Varenk, though, retains second overall on the stage. He's finished second as well, but conceding three minutes and four seconds to Ulrich. Reese was third, but he also conceded more than three minutes. Overall, Ulrich now leads this tour by five minutes and 42 seconds over Richard Varenk. Abraham Olano is third, but eight minutes back. Now they face the climb of Alp Duez, 203.5 kilometres, for the 172 survivors of this tour. This is going to be a tough one. They are now going to the mecca of cycling, the Alp itself. Well, in all the years that I've come to Alp Duiz, I've never seen an atmosphere quite like this. We've estimated perhaps a quarter of a million people are on its slopes. The Tour de France has arrived at the big mountain. We know there are 30,000 Danish making their way here. We know there are busloads of Pantani supporters. And I'm quite sure now there are indeed plenty of supporters for Jan Ulrich. 
Well, we've seen the German conquer the Pyrenees. We've seen him ride the brilliant time trial. Now, just how is this sporting revelation going to climb up Alp Duez? Let's go to Paul Sherwin, who's now going to analyse his climbing style. The most important thing about riding the mountain pass is just trying to conserve as much power for as long as possible. Now, when I rode my first Tour de France, Barry Hoban said to me, when you're approaching a long climb like this with all these zigzag turns, the only way to do it is to go around the outside of the corner where it's not quite as steep. Now, the amazing thing about Jan Ulrich is he climbs with sheer power. As he comes up to the corners, you can see he's sitting very comfortably on his saddle, all of the power coming from the back part of his body and his thighs. When he comes into the corner, he hugs the line right around the steepest part of the apex. If you've got a chance at home, go up one of the local climbs and try riding on the inside. You'll see just how tough it is. Once he then gets to the straight part, he accelerates away, not even getting out of the saddle, indicating this man climbs with pure power. But Al Duez has 21 corners like that. Does he have the power to be able to do it 21 times? I'm not so sure. Well, we're about to find out, Paul, because the whole field are racing through the lovely little town of Bourg d'Oison at kilometre 187. Very shortly they will turn left and the climb of the Alp will be all before them because it's non-stop climbing right up to the finishing line. Field basically all together here. It's been a gentle ride, but not all good news for everybody. Festina trying to get their men right into the launching pad, but at 54 kilometres today, Chris Borman of Great Britain abandons the tour in tears suffering from crash injuries and torn neck muscle, muscles from his fall on the Col de Soulor. Right, well on we go Paul, and we're now heading up the mountain itself and Festina in the driving seat again. Well every time there's a mountain coming you know they really will try and put Jan Ulrich and Bjarn Arys under pressure. Bjarn Arys still riding very well, but at the moment I think he's playing a secondary role to the man wearing the yellow jersey. This is Laurent Brochard at the front, no longer in the polka dot jersey, but now riding as a teammate for his own man Richard Virenk. And I wouldn't like to be in this bunch now because the speed they approach out Duez and it is such a steep climb but all of the domestiques trying to get their climbers to the start of it together. It is very, very quick as they race over the little river here. Now they'll turn left and then the climb will have begun. Alp Duez is on the horizon. Well, I think this is really the climb everybody has been waiting for, Paul. And immediately the yellow jersey is there, the polka dot jersey is there, and Casa Grande is there, and Reese is there. Well, that's remarkable because, Phil, this is the mecca of the climbs for all of the climbers. Every climber wants to win here on Alpe d'Huez, and I'm quite sure Richard Viron does as well because he's never won a stage of the mountains in the, in the Alps. That's right, but he has won two stages in the Pyrenees as he now dances behind Jan Ulrich. This rider certainly isn't afraid to carry that Maillot Jean right at the front of affairs, is he? Well, it's amazing. He's now the leader of the Tour de France and I would have thought that Bjarne Arys would have come to the front to help him out just a little bit because he does need some encouragement. He does need somebody alongside him just to say, look, the team's here, we're still supporting you. He's still looking for Bjarne Reese. he constantly looks over his shoulder to see where Reese is. He is an amazing rider, it's almost as if he's the reluctant leader of the Tour. It's very strange to see him riding like this, there on the right hand side is Elefantino, Marco Pantani, now nicknamed also El Pirato, the pirate, <laughs> and he really is trying to put some pressure on these riders. Now he moves to the front and Reese still looking very comfortable. Well he too has scored big victories in the Pyrenees, now looking for a win in the Alps as well. This is a savage acceleration by Pantani. This is on the early slopes of the climb as well. Varenk is the answer to it. He's right with him, but I wonder what damage he's doing behind. Everybody has filed out behind Marco Pantani. Ulrich is there as well. We saw Pantani throw his hat off just before he came through to start this acceleration. And this is the secret of good climbers, Paul, the way they can accelerate. Well, it's not just that, it's the way they can accelerate again and again. And it's interesting to see this time Bjarne Arys is there. He's sitting on the back of this group of four riders. So it may well be that after the tough time he had in the Pyrenees, he has finally recuperated. And Casa Grande and Escartin are the losers there. The man we've also not mentioned, Abraham Olano. We haven't seen anything of him since the real attack started on this climb. Now we've got these four riders going up the slopes. I have never seen so many people on this mountain and I've seen every climb here except the one of Fausto Coppi. I'm not quite as old as 1952. But it was amazing driving here, you know, 40 kilometers, 25 miles of traffic jam just to get to the bottom of the slope here. It is remarkable. I think this is the greatest out of the West we've witnessed in these recent years. A perfect, perfect day as well. It's very often cold on this mountain at the top, but it's beautiful today. You can see the shadows of the riders 
Now Pantani is setting the pace and looking for help from no one at the moment. And Ulrich, who started the tempo at the bottom, now content to follow. These four riders looking pretty solid just now. Well, Pantani's great to see him back. There's the earring that's earned him the nickname of the Pirate. He's just getting into a rhythm here, just putting the pressure on everybody else. Looks over his shoulders to see what sort of damage he's doing. But you know, he really is flying, and I think most certainly he's back. And I was quite convinced after that crash he had in the Tour of Italy that we wouldn't see a great mark of Pantani here in the Tour de France. But I think he certainly is back, and he's great. I don't think anybody seriously thought he would ever come back from the crash he had in Milan Turin, which caused all of his problems, but he has come back. He is very much a part of this tour again. Remember, he's had a third place finish in the Tour de France, as well as winning a couple of stages. So it's amazing to watch the difference between the two climbers at the front, Marco Pantani and Richard Virenc, bobbing around on the machines, using the upper part of their body to try and keep the gears going around, while all the time Ulrich is sitting down. A glance at the second group here, we've just seen Alano, there's Jimenez, the champion of Spain, there's Alano, 151, Escartin is here, now this is interesting, that's Laurent Madwas also in this group. Now look at this, Paul, we've gone back to the leaders just in time, because it looks as though they've cracked Rhys. Well, I think he's put the white flag up there because he couldn't stay with the pace being set by the two climbers. He's just going to ride at his own pace now and leave it up to Jan Ulrich in the yellow jersey to mark the two best climbers of this year's Tour de France, Marco Pantani and Richard Virenc. But still, Ulrich looking very calm, sitting down. It's amazing the power he uses when he climbs. He's such a deceptive bike rider, sitting there solid as a horse. Now, further down, number one, last year's winner, is in desperate trouble yet again on the mountains he loved so much last year, where he gained all of his time in the Alps. Now in the Alps on the first day, serious climbs like it was in the Pyrenees first day, Bjorn Rees is in difficulty. There's the flags that will cheer him on. The official figure coming out of Denmark was 30,000 spectators were all heading for the Alps. Well, that's an awful lot of beer I think is going to be drunk tonight <laughs> because the Danes certainly do like their lager. Marco Pantani, he's not thinking about beers at the moment. All he wants to do is try and crack the two men that are with him because actually bear in, in mind, Phil, that he's the defending champion at Alpe d'Huez because the Tour didn't come here last year. Uh, that's absolutely right, a winner here, of course, yes. And uh, I've almost forgotten about that, actually, Paul. But Pantani is the defending champion of Alpe d'Huez and Bjorn Aris is the defending champion of the Tour de France. Now he's gonna, he knows the situation he's in, he knows that he's hitting just about his limit. Now he's gonna have to settle down and hope he recovers as the climb goes on. That's the only thing he can do, find a rhythm that's comfortable for himself and hope that by the top of the climb he doesn't lose too much time. And these men at the front though really are flying up the mountain. The record as well for the ascent of the climb here held by Marco Pantani himself when he won the climb just a couple of years ago. And that's circa 38 minutes as Pantani continues to keep the tempo here. And the crowd you can hear cheering all of the way, but this little climber staying out of the saddle now, riding on the bottom of the handlebars, no relaxed climbing at all from him. He's just keeping the rhythm high. He actually looks as though he might be causing a little bit of distress here to Jan Ulrich. He doesn't look as cool all of a sudden. Well, he's starting to bob and weave just a little bit, but it's amazing. Pantani has not asked anyone for any help. He's put everyone under pressure, and a man who thought he could ride well in the Alpe d'Huez, Luc Leblanc, also falling away from the leader. He's a long way behind. Well, this hasn't been the season for poor old Luc Leblanc. He was looking set, and oh, crikey, back to the leaders, and it looks as though Ulrich has cracked, unless Ferenc opened the door and pulled round behind him. Well, I think Ferenc just couldn't stay on the wheel of Marco Pantani, and the reaction now has come by Jan Ulrich, and he's closed down on Pantani, the climber, so it just goes to show how strong the man from Germany is. To respond to an attack like that really is quite remarkable. This is a superb piece of tempo riding, but very briefly, as I was saying about Luc Leblanc, he had uh, all set to finish third in the Tour already, had that spectacular crash in the time trial there, coming down a mountain, and I don't think he's really refound himself at all. He struggled every day in this event. The one man struggling now, Phil, is Richard Virenc. In yep. fact, that acceleration out of the corner there has put the climber from France into difficulties, and he couldn't stay with the two leaders, so now just two men up the road, Marco Pantani in the yellow jersey of Jan Ulrich. The one thing that Richard can be sure of is plenty of support, but he's losing ground here, and this is the first time we've seen a little climber from France be attacked as well. But really, Pantoni, at 10 kilometers to go, has just simply stayed out of the saddle. Now he's starting to go in and out of the saddle. 
He's kept the rhythm so high and they've all tried and so far failed to match him. Only Ulrich again surviving. Well, he'll get a lot of confidence out of that because I think the man he will have been a little worried about on the climb of Alpe d'Huez is Richard Virenque. Once again, he gets out of the saddle. He accelerates, trying to put the pressure on Ulrich because I think before the summit, he'd like to get rid of this man from Germany. But look at the face on Richard Virenque. He's suffering like a dog and all he can do now is just hope that he can pull himself back. Well, he knows he has a little bit of time in hand and it's probably just as well because I think he's finally decided to let the little pirates escape. He's 9 minutes 11 seconds behind Jan Ulrich in the overall classification, lying fifth at the moment. And so every pedal rev now will gain time on everybody in the tour. We see how Pantani went round the wide part of the corner there. It was not quite as steep. He came out of it, accelerated away and the gap opened up immediately. Ulrich isn't panicking though, he's just sitting there, setting a nice pace for himself, making sure that Pantani doesn't open up the gap too rapidly. So Marco Pantani is doing what I think just about everybody on this mountain came to see him do, this magic little climber, go away from the rest of the race. He is now pedalling a higher place in the overall classification for sure. He's not going to damage the lead of Jan Ulrich today. Ulrich perhaps wisely knows that. He's not crucifying himself, trying to hold the back wheel of a man who is simply on a mission. But it's amazing he's always looking over his shoulder, trying to see exactly what's happening behind him. This time he's not looking for Reese. In fact, he's looking for the whereabouts of Richard Virenque. But Marco Pantani, well, his wings have come back. This is the Battle of the Alp, and the Italians have had a lot of success here. They started it back in 1952 with Fausto Coppi. Then came Gianni Bugno with a couple of wins. Then Roberto Conti got a win here, and that was his only win after 10 years as a pro, and still is. He's been a pro 14 years now. And now Pantani trying for a second time. And interestingly enough, that Roberto Conti rides on the same team now as Marco Pantani. Worked very well this year in the Tour of Italy, and I think he's having his best Tour de France in several years as well. Jean-Marie Leblanc, director of the Tour de France, also rode this race on two occasions in the late 60s, enjoying the best seat in the house uh, just behind Jan Ulrich. But this is the man who is opening the waters. Here comes the Red Indian. I think he's Danish, this chap. I met him earlier on the slopes, uh, but I, he certainly enjoyed his lagers today, and I don't think Pantani is, has any wish to hear any war cries down his left ear. Well, maybe it was the smell of alcohol in his breath. <laughs> Pantani wanted to get away because he feels with just 22 seconds advantage, he needs as much oxygen as possible. Well, I have to say, the crowd here full of good humour, and they've come to see great sportsmen in action, and there's none greater than Pantani when he's climbing. Here we go, back to the slow motion now. There's a little tickle in the ribs uh, to push the Red Indian to the left. Well, the time gap's there, 22 seconds to Ian Ulrich, 42 seconds to Richard Virenque, and 1 minute 22 to Bjarne Ries. So Ries failing away, falling away quite rapidly. Now this is not going to be the tour of Bjarne Ries now, but it's still looking like the tour of Jan Ulrich because he's still second on this mountain despite the escape of Marco Pantani. Varenk isn't far behind. Uh, Casagrande, Ries, uh, and we haven't caught sight of those for a while, but they are the next on the climb. Here, in fact, he's joined by Francesco Casagrande, the Casagrande at the front in the red jersey. He's setting the pace, trying, I think, to make sure that Bjarne Ries and himself stay in the picture. But Marco Pantani, well, he's on a mission. He's looking to become the first rider to win two years in succession, I suppose, because the Tour didn't come here last year, so he's really hoping that he's going to be the champion and really walking himself into third place. Well, let's hope so. And certainly if he does, he'll knock out Alano because Alano has been lost on the early part of this climb today. He got dropped very early on. And Pantani's under the four kilometres to go banner. The Italian flag right alongside him there, but I bet that gentleman can't hold that pace too long as he wipes out half the crowd on the right. Well, the get very dangerous part of the course here. He's just gone under the four kilometre banner. Once he gets to around about three, then the barriers appear and it makes it a lot safer for the riders on the final few corners up into the town of Alpe d'Huez. But Pantani, well, nobody's going to touch him now as he goes under that banner. And this is Ulrich now under the same four kilometre banner. And that's not too far behind. He's probably around about 25 seconds down at the moment. So he's not losing that much. 
fact, Richard Virenk is losing a little bit of time. His time gap there was one minute and two seconds. So the French climber falling away. But Phil, the crowds here are unbelievable. I don't remember ever seeing them as big as this. Well, we used to say, get there early in the morning a few years ago if you want to see this climb from a good spot. Then we altered that to get there the day before. Well, now we know there are many people coming here up to three days before just to claim their regular spot on the mountain. This is the first time that Jan Ulrich would have experienced this climb with all the crowd out there. A lot of Germans have come now to the Tour de France as well to support this man because I think they can see the makings of a champion, a new man on the block, the man who I think is probably going to dominate the Tour de France for the next few years. But Phil, just look at the crowds. Well, officially they're telling us that three quarters of a million people are lining the nine miles of Alpe d'Huez today. That might be an exaggeration, but when you see shots like that, I'm no longer sure it is. And Marco Pantani has now got himself between the barriers, the safe stretch of the course. And these barriers put up after that debacle we had a few years ago when Fabio Parra was brought literally to a standstill by the crowd and the block cars. But a fine right-hand turn by Marco Pantani, taking your advice there, Paul, he went round the outside. But I don't think he expected <laughs> to be going quite that fast. He's flying up the final kilometre here of the Alpe d'Huez. But, you know, I hope he doesn't make the mistake he made two years ago because he also nearly lost it in the final left-hand bend to the finish and went straight on into the parking lot. Well, this time, I think he'll be guided by simply by the crowds and the barriers. We're now into the lovely town here on the top of the mountain of Alpe d'Huez. This town literally opens for the arrival of the Tour de France. In the next 48 hours, it will have all closed down again, awaiting the ski season. But at this time of the year, in July, it is vibrant, and there are thousands of people here now. We're going into the lower slopes of its streets, and then it will climb steadily to the summit. Jan Ulrich riding very sensibly, still hovering around 25 seconds behind Marco Pantani. He's not pulling anything back, but I think he'll be very happy with the ride that he's put in today. But Pantani now into the town square, across the town square, he'll get the left-hand turn, and then it'll be up to the finish. He's got about 600 metres lead over Jan Ulrich as he heads up towards the finish. That's around 35 seconds. All the road is his now as he moves into the last 500 metres to the line. There'll be the sharp left-hand turn where even Greg Lamond has made a mistake at one occasion finishing here. You've got to watch it. It's easy to overshoot it. But Pantani now, this victory is going to be equally as special to him as Zabel's revenge on his disqualification last week was to him. Because this means he is back as a big-time climber. He didn't have time to see himself on the big screen there as he swung round the left-hand bend. But now he's going to win this stage the second time in succession, although there's a gap of one year in between. Marco Pantani of Mercatoni Uno will be the winner at Alpe d'Huez today. He will gain time on everyone. He will climb up the overall classification as well. This is going to be a great feeling for him. He gets the victory, 203 kilometres covered. He's the first to the top of the Alp. And the gap is around about half a minute for the next man, the Mayo Jean of the Tour de France, Jan Ulrich, is coming home. And Ulrich again confirming he is most definitely the man to beat in this year's Tour. And I don't think anybody can or will. He grits his teeth. He really has suffered on this climb. But now he's become a complete all-round bike rider. 46 seconds the gap. It's amazing, he still had time to look over his shoulder to see what the time gap was. Richard Virenk has failed a little bit over the final kilometre. He's going to go almost one and a half minutes behind the winner, Marco Pantani. But I think he'll be more worried about the fact of how much time he's lost to Jan Ulrich. So Richard Varenk is coming up sprinting for his life here. He will just about hang on to his second place overall, I think, as the polka dot jersey gets more points for third place in the King of the Mountains competition as well. So the result of the stage to outdo as Marco Pantani gets a second win here ahead of Ulrich Varenk and Bjorn Larister in fifth place, two minutes 28 seconds back for him.